So last night, I finally finished Starfield's Shattered Space DLC. I completed it live on Twitch, and I did it in just under two sessions, amassing in total around 10 hours of playtime. So now all is said and done, what do I think? Is Shattered Space good? Well, yeah. Is Shattered Space as good as I wanted it to be? No. Is Shattered Space the DLC that's finally fixed Starfield and made it the Skyrim level breadwinner that we've all wanted it to be? Also no. But did I enjoy Shattered Space? Yeah. Good day, it's me, Kingcraft, and welcome back to my channel. This video is my review, thoughts, and opinions on Starfield's new Shattered Space DLC. Now, this video will contain full spoilers for the story of Shattered Space, so this is your chance to click off the video if you don't want to hear them. Before I get into my thoughts on the DLC, let's just summarize the plot of Shattered Space. While traveling through space, we discover a mysterious space station called the Oracle. Someone is broadcasting a warning over the intercoms. Once we board it, we find it overrun with hostiles known as Phantoms. These ethereal beings who appear to be, at one time or another, human, still remain on the space station. We restore the power to the station, and the entire station grav jumps to Varun Kai, the home planet of House Varun. When we arrive, we find that Varun Kai's capital city, Dazra, has been devastated by a massive explosion of energy from an unknown source, originating from the city's capital building, the Scaled Citadel. This cataclysmic event has left a force field of some sort around the Scaled Citadel, preventing anyone from entering, and the surrounding area is guarded by more, very hostile, phantom beings. The people of Varun believe it was a biblical event enacted by their god, the Great Serpent. So who or what is the Great Serpent? Happened. According to House Varun, its true nature and origins are unclear, but it's often associated with cosmic forces and the universe's creation, symbolizing a cosmic cycle of destruction and renewal. Once we enter the city, we see another phantom being, but this one's not hostile, and the leaders of House Varun are trying to converse with it. However, the phantom cannot hear them, but he can hear us. Speaking to the phantom, we learn that his name is Anasco Varun, the speaker of House Varun. Anasco serves as the serpent's mouthpiece, communicating its will to the people. However, since Anasco was transformed, into one of these phantom beings, the rest of House Varun can no longer communicate with him. Since it appears that we can communicate with him, the leader of House Dolkef, a man named Malabor, believes that we've been sent by the Great Serpent to save Anasco. He requests that we join House Varun proper, but to do this we must first become a Promised, which is what they call those who have converted to House Varun. To become a Promised, we must take part in a ritual, a ritual that none have undertaken for generations. We meet with a lady called Herald Anaza, and she acts as our guide through the ritual which takes place in a cave called the Serpent's Path. As we travel through the cave, Anaza recites the origins of their religion. A man named Jinan Varun was traveling aboard a spaceship called The Morning with fellow human beings, until one day he had a vision of the Great Serpent. The Serpent imparted his knowledge with Jinan so he may teach the others. Jinan and his people settled on Varun Kai in these very caves, where Jinan taught them of their place in the universe. He told them of the Great Serpent's shrouding, where the Serpent would one day return and encircle the universe that he had created and all those who did not follow would be cast into shadow. One of the teachings along the serpent's path was to sacrifice a little groat, and I felt pretty bad about that. Well, that bit weren't very cool. <laughs> the final part of the ritual, we're asked to choose two of four aspects of House Varun. Devotion, obedience, strength, and perseverance. I chose Strength and Perseverance. Now we're officially part of House Varun. The houses want to construct a machine called the Morning Device to try and breach the gravitational barrier surrounding the Scaled Citadel, granting them access once again so they can investigate and find the cause of the explosion or perhaps connect with their god. Before this is possible, we must reunite the houses of House Varun so they can work together and operate the Morning Device. We also have to obtain an energy source known as a Vortex Interlock. And it just so happens that two of them can be found deep beneath the local dam that provides water to the local farms. After gaining access to the dam, we discovered a secret underground science facility which is guarded by two phantoms. They warn us against meddling with the Vortex Interlocks, and after battling them multiple times, we can remove at least one of the Vortex Interlocks. We have the option to take a second one, but by doing so, we'll kill the two phantoms. As they explain, the Vortex Interlock also controls the power for the dam and the water reserves. As a result, the local farms and civilians will suffer if we remove the second Vortex Interlock. I decided to take both. Returning to Dazro, we hand over one of the Vortex Interlocks to power the morning device, and we fire it at the Citadel. Three, two, one. Fire. 
successfully breaking the barrier around it. Inside we meet Anasco. He informs us that the secret underground facility at the dam was used to experiment with the power of the vortexes. They discovered the ability to transform into these phantoms and gained the ability to teleport across vast star systems. Anasco believed they could use these newfound powers to create an army of phantoms and invade the settled systems, killing all that did not believe in the Great Serpent. A crusade as he called it. He believed this would be the will of the Great Serpent. Deep below the Citadel, Anasco asks us to use one of the second Vortex interlocks to stabilize the Citadel's reactor and save his experiments. The experiments in question is his army of phantom soldiers. Anasco leads us to a room filled with pods containing human bodies, each one a phantom for Anasco's crusade. Since Anasco is a phantom and technically not in our physical plane of existence, he cannot activate the pods and free his army, so he requests that we release them. But doing so will doom all of the settled systems to a genocide at the hands of Anasco's phantoms. Alternatively, we can just shut down the pods and shut down the life support and eliminate every last phantom. Naturally, this is what I chose to do, and this obviously greatly angers Anasco. He attempts to flee to the Pinnacle, a portal that he's built in order to teleport his army and the Citadel to the settled systems. If he's allowed to activate the Pinnacle, the entire planet of Varun Kai will be destroyed. As we chase after Anasco, the zealots of House Varun storm the Citadel, likely to seize whatever power they can for themselves. Fighting our way through the hordes and waves of zealots and phantoms who have infiltrated the facility, we reach Anasco at the Pinnacle. We destroy the Pinnacle by exposing and shooting four modulators that can be opened one at a time by activating specific specific switches around the room. After destroying the pinnacle, Anasco is defeated. The pinnacle begins to implode and the citadel begins to be consumed by the powers of the vortex. Running to the exit as we escape the citadel, the vortex consumes it and the screen fades to black. I'm not doing anything. We awake in our new player home, surrounded by the three house leaders. They inquire what transpired at the Citadel and ask what fate befell Anasco. We explain about the Vortex and Anasco's desire to enact a holy crusade in the name of the Great Serpent. The house leaders at first are eager to continue Anasco's plan, still believing that he was the speaker and that his plan is still the will of the Great Serpent. But without a speaker, they're unsure what to do next, then realize that without Anasco, they are now the highest authority on Varun Kai. But as normal, they can't agree on which house should be the next ruling dynasty, so they ask us as the Vindicator, and Andresia as a witness, to appoint the next ruling house. I chose Malabor of Dol Kef, as he seems to be the most level-headed of the three. Uh, you. I think you should. You're the most level-headed one. And so it shall be. As such, he anoints us as the new speaker and asks us to decide whether or not House Varun should continue Anasco's crusade. At this point, Andresia interjects. Consider what you are about to say very carefully. Lovek Vathal still believes in Anasco's crusade and wanted to attack the Settled Systems. I chose to vote against the crusade, as the Settled Systems are for the most part civilized and pretty peaceful, and a religious war would only lead to unnecessary bloodshed. Malabor of House Dul Kef and Kajimal of House Kadik agreed with me. Andresia was surprisingly okay with my decision, and I'm glad she kept her humanity after getting to experience life outside of House Varun. And that's the main quest of Shared Space. So the game recommends you start the DLC at level 35. I started at level 30, and I thought I'd just wing it. It's normally the way I do things, and if you've watched any of my streams before, you'll know this. However, I don't think I died a single time during the entire playthrough. I came close a few times, but didn't really struggle to defeat any of the enemies. Even the mini-bosses and the final boss wasn't really that difficult. And I think this is because a few months prior, I downloaded the Trackers Alliance DLC, which upon completion gives the player the Arban Nova Strike Sniper. Now this thing is really OP and it kills most enemies in one shot and it's not even upgraded. It's just the bog standard weapon and it made fighting enemies a piece of cake. I did however upgrade it as much as I possibly could just before the final boss fight though. I did occasionally use other weapons if I got bored of the sniper but even then the enemies were still pretty easy to defeat. It wasn't until I was writing this script and re-watching my footage that I realized that the city of Dazra doesn't have those randomly and infinitively spawning NPCs like New Atlantis does. And I don't know if that's and I don't know if that was to make the city seem underpopulated because loads of people have died. Or if Bethesda really took that criticism on board and realized that those soulless monstrosities really shouldn't exist. After all was said and done, I can safely say I really enjoyed the main quest of Shattered Space. 
more than I did the main quest of Starfield, but in some ways, not so much. Personally, I'd been anticipating Shattered Space to be like the far harbour of Starfield, the missing piece of the puzzle that would finally make Starfield captivating and fill that void that I felt whilst I was playing through the, the base game. And that coupled with the vehicle update, I really thought would fix Starfield. I have a video about the vehicle update if you're interested, it'll be up in the top corner. <laughs> Shattered Space still suffers from the same drawbacks and pitfalls as the base game. Outside the main city of Dazra, there isn't really anything interesting enough to make me want to explore the outskirts of the city. Yes, locations surrounding the city do appear to be handcrafted, but they're not really alluring. I found myself avoiding them, staying far away from the city limits unless a quest specifically required me to go there. Like for example, I came across a couple of scientists who were examining the local wildlife and flora, trying to figure out why the animals were dying and why the plant life was changing, so naturally they send the player out to collect data. It's essentially fetch quests to collect data from very generic plants and very generic wildlife that you've already seen if you've spent more than five minutes outside of the city walls. It felt like a radiant quest that could have just been indefinitely repeated if you wanted to. I get that maybe the idea for the quest was to push the player outside of the city and en encourage them to explore the surrounding areas, but I found myself pulling up my map and fast traveling as close as possible to the quest markers just so I could avoid having to run or fly or drive to them, and like I said, most of the lands outside the city are just monotonous and hard to distinguish from one another. Except for a few locations located outside the city, which many quests led you to, such as the dam and the farm. They are recognisable locations and give you a good point of reference for where you are on the planet if you can see them in the distance, but it's the areas in between those points of interest and the city that just look and feel so empty and void of life. I don't know what it is about the forests of Oblivion that are just a pure joy to walk around compared to the surface of most planets in Starfield. Maybe it's because the forests in Oblivion are smaller and it doesn't take as long to walk through them? So you don't get bored as quick? I, I don't know. After collecting the data for these scientists, they reward you with credits, and that's it, just credits. And like I kept saying in my live stream, I had no motivation to earn money or save money or spend money because I hadn't had any need to. I'm not invested enough to want to purchase a home or ammo or armor. I can find all those things anyway from exploring if I wanted to or from doing quests. So I ended up with so much money and nothing to do with it. So all I felt was just disappointment when I'd hand in one of these quests and they'd just give me credits. Not to mention the dialogue, my god the dialogue. My main gripe with Starfield as a whole is the amount of talking that the NPCs do. If it pertains to something interesting, I'm all for an NPC talking my ear off if I'm actually invested in what they have to say, but most NPCs tell you their whole life story when really they could just relay what they have to say in a few sentences, and they make everything sound so important and urgent and it's really not. These scientists are a good example. The back and forth about the data I've collected and what it could mean and the big scientific breakthroughs they're making, I just, I really don't care. I'm sorry, but it's so bloody boring. Now that isn't at all a criticism on the voice actors, I will say all the voice actors just do a phenomenal job in Starfield and Shattered Space. Another example is this guy I met in Dazra City called Ekris. The council sent me to him to inquire about the status of building the morning device, the giant machine they were planning on using to destroy the force field around the citadel. And he kept going on and on and on, bickering between the three houses of Varun, which was just delaying the construction of the morning device. But he kept waffling on to the point where I was just mashing the tab button to try and end the dialogue and get as far away from him as possible because I just didn't care. <laughs> But then on the other hand, I overheard two brothers having an argument in the city plaza. Two brothers fighting because the younger brother had tried to pawn their mother's ashes to fund his alcoholism. Naturally, the older brother felt this was really disrespectful to their mother and to their family, and as such demanded a duel to the death against his younger brother. Now, because we were eavesdropping on the conversation, we were wrangled into the situation to be the second to the little brother. Now, the job of the second was to see if we could negotiate some sort of truce between the two, or get an apology, for example. But the youngest brother would not apologize, and the oldest brother wouldn't let go of his pride, so the duel had to go ahead. A lady called Danica was tasked with providing weapons and arranging the duel for the older brother. She could see, like myself, though, that even after the unforgivable actions of the younger brother, Murdering him would not solve anything, so Danica asked us in secret if we could slip a sedative into their drinks, 
which the brothers were going to consume before the duel. We have the option to spike both their drinks, only one of their drinks, or none of their drinks, and the outcomes are exactly what you'd think. Spiking one drink means the other brother wins the duel, spiking both drinks means that the duel is momentarily called off whilst the brothers recover. The idea is that in this recovery time the brothers will cool off and come to their senses. Thankfully after spiking both drinks the brothers decided to rearrange the duel. But later on if the player returns to the area where they were going to have the duel you can overhear them reconciling their differences and realising that a duel was not the answer and it's quite a sweet moment. Duel is off and it Yay. should never have happened to begin with. The truth is that when the duel was sabotaged I had never felt so relieved in my life. I do not want to kill you, Malila. I am ashamed to have ever challenged you. I am sorry. It was actually one of the highlights of my entire playthrough of Shattered Space. It's believable and understandable, and they're relatable characters. Not the selling your mother's ashes, but, you know, siblings fighting. And it's characters like that and events like that that make the world seem alive. This is something that Bethesda can do well, it's just a shame that it's few and far between in Starfield. Take for instance the leaders of House Kadik and House Vethal. Not only do their voice actors do a phenomenal job, but their dialogue and interactions are actually interesting and compelling to listen to. You don't feel like you're forced to listen to an NPC just reel off exposition, but rather you're involved in an actual enthralling conversation. Also, Razma Kadik is kind of hot. Speaking of House Kadik, the zealots of House Varun, which compared to the other houses are basically the extremists of House Varun, kidnapped members of House Kadik, and Razma asks for your help in rescuing them. After saving them, a woman called Sahima, which is also one of the new companions in the DLC. We meet up with Razma and a zealot to negotiate the release of the hostages, only for me to butt in and let them know I've already freed the hostages from under the zealot's noses. So rather than negotiate with terrorists, I pop out my sniper and quickly take care of the zealots. It was also my attempt to impress Miss Razma. I'm not sure how it went. The leader of House Vethal is a dude called Victor. Now this guy is an asshole. His son Verric ran away from the city because he doesn't believe in the great slippery serpent god and doesn't want to be the heir to the Vethal house. This made his dad big mad and he spends a good amount of time throwing his toys out the pram about it. But the dude's voice actor does an amazing job. I fully believe that this guy was pissed off. This is a Ministry of State matter and I will handle it as I see fit. He is a traitor. He turned his back not only on his family, but on our people's entire belief system. The fact that he still breathes is a stain upon the House Vethal name. Victor wants us to track down Verric and kill him, and as proof, we must return with his signet ring with their family crest on it as proof of my deeds. This quest is pretty interesting, and one that gets you out of the city and exploring a bit. We first meet up with one of Verric's friends at a bar in search of information of where he could have gone. But the dude's drunk, so we don't really get much out of him, but again, the voice actor did an incredible job. It was very entertaining talking to him. Unfortunately, he had a terrible case of Bethesda bug though and kept snapping between leaning on the bar being a cool dude and then standing up possibly happened possibly another one of Rex friends was a chunky dude called Tane who is essentially just a discount version of Jackie Wells Tane had a tracker on Verrick that led us to an abandoned camp now this place is really cool and Bethesda has always been masters of environmental storytelling so having to examine this location for clues and piece it all together of what happened to Verrick was really enjoyable. It's just a shame about this bug where there was supposed to be some sort of creature on the ground, but it was missing. And while looking for more clues, I found the dude's crapper. There's toilet roll and a bucket that you know is filled with shit. He pooped in there. Oh god, I kicked it! Oh, it's gonna spill out! <laughs> After following some visual clues, we follow tracks to a grope farm nearby. These farmers tell us that they saw Verrick and they patched him up and directed him to a long abandoned grope farm. When we arrive, we find notes from Verrick about his feelings on his father and why he's ran away. Also, I just love the way this guy just slides up into view. <laughs> We agree to let him go if he pays us 10k and gives us the signet ring. Returning to his father, the dude's happy with the idea that his son's dead. I told you guys, this guy's an asshole. So Shattered Space suffers from the same abysmal loot issues as Starfield, and by that I mean, why is every container and door locked? 
Starfield's lockpicking system is cool to look at, and in terms of a minigame, it's kind of cool, you know, it really gets the cogs turning in your mind, but for the love of Todd Howard, it's one of the most tedious aspects of the entire game. If it takes me on average 30 seconds to pick a lock, whether that be an ammo container or a door, and the only reward I get is a basic pistol that you can find anywhere else, or some junk, or some materials, or sometimes nothing at all. Why would I bother unlocking things? Not to mention digipicks seem to be the rarest item in the known universe, because I always seem to not have any. However, I think Bethesda heard this complaint before because I did notice towards the latter parts of the main quest, digipics were everywhere sometimes two or three in the same spot. But even though I now had a fair few digipics, I still didn't bother unlocking things because it takes so much time and it just didn't justify the utterly shit loot that you get. No, I'm not unlocking another thing, man. I know you give me loads of digipics, but I can't be asked. That being said, Shattered Space does add a few new weapons and armor. The armor and clothing aren't much to write home about, however, but my personal favorites are the Varun suit and scarf. Looks pretty cool. The scarf sort of blows in the wind. The Varun cargo wear hat. The hat kind of looks like a Pokemon trainer hat, and I'm sure someone could whip up a, a retexture mod for that real quick. That would be awesome. The Varun guard elite helmet and armor looks pretty cool too. I also came across, I believe, a unique helmet, the Varun mining space helmet. Now, it is just a typical mining helmet that you can find in the base game, but this one is gray with neon green accents. And I don't know, it looks cool to me. It's kind of like a Razer keyboard or a RGB lighting <laughs> on the inside of the helmet. It looks pretty sweet. As for the weapons, the roster is short, but it does expand on Varun's arsenal with a Varun rifle, pistol, minigun, and sword. And I really do like the aesthetic of the Varun weapons. So to see a complete set was very pleasing to me. Now, I know I said exploration in Shattered Space was lackluster, but I would be remiss if I did not mention something that Bethesda have always been experts at, and that is environmental storytelling. Similar to the abandoned camp I mentioned earlier, I came across two other unique, unmarked locations that I just have to share with you. Firstly was the Bounty Hunter's Nest, atop a cliff overlooking said abandoned camp. There's a little Bounty Hunter's camp here with a small sniper nest. You can find a sleeping bag, a briefcase, some cooking supplies, a Bounty Hunter's spacesuit, and next to it perched on the top of the cliff is a little sniper. You can really picture that perhaps, you know, the sniper saw us coming and just skedaddled. He was in such a rush he just left all of his stuff there. Or perhaps someone kicked him off the cliff, who knows. The second point of interest I found was after lowering the water levels at the dam, I found this jolly fellow doing a spot of fishing, and it looks like he hasn't really caught anything for a while, so I took my picture with him. Now with this being a House Varun expansion, naturally I had to take my space waifu Andresia with me, and I'm really glad I did. As expected, she had dialogue to interject at multiple times during the main quest, even side quests. I'm sure the other companions have dialogue too, but you can really tell Bethesda specifically crafted Andresia's responses around this expansion. They really expected you to take her with you. I felt her responses were well-weighted and well thought out, not taking one side or the other unless it was a particularly moral issue, but she does take the time to ask your opinion and offer advice for certain situations, and it was pleasant to bring her along. I would definitely say you enjoy the Shattered Space DLC more, if you bring her with you. I did also like at the very end of the main quest, Andresia interjects when the house leaders are asking if they should continue their religious crusade. Despite these being her people and her beliefs, she doesn't force your hand and respects your decision. I do feel like they could have done a lot more dialogue with Andresia though, like the chance to ask her more questions about her home planet, her life, her memories, her family, etc. But I'm glad we at least got something. So that's my review, thoughts, and opinions on Shattered Space. What did you think of it? Did you share any of the same opinions as me? Or do you disagree with my assessment? By all means, comment down below and let me know. I've said it before, but I will say it again. I have not given up on Starfield. I can see potential, and if Bethesda don't manage to make Starfield reach that potential, the community and modders can do so much with this game, and I think together we can turn this game into something more akin to our vision. You know, the Starfield that we've always wanted. Starfield does pose a lot of questions for the fate of Fallout 5, The Elder Scrolls 6, but as I said on my stream, thank you so much for watching or listening. I wanted to make a video similar to this about Starfield when it first came out, but everyone and their cat made a review video about Starfield, and I just didn't have anything new to add to the discussion. So I've spent all day making this video to have my say on this DLC. So if you're new to my channel and my content, thank you for making it to the end. I create lots of content on the Elder Scrolls, Fallout, and obviously Starfield. I'm planning on branching my content out to other topics and games in the coming months, so it would mean a lot 
if you subscribed and joined our community, The Kinglings. I also stream on Twitch multiple times a week with modded Skyrim and the likes, so it would be really awesome to see you in chat sometime. Join the Discord, it's the best place to get updates on streams and videos. You can support my content on any of these platforms, and thank you once again to the Royal Kinglings for your continued support. That's all from me guys, take care, and I will see you soon.